Hey guys, welcome back to Bible Studies for Life. Again, a Lifeway resource that we use here at Marion First Baptist Church. Hey, wherever you guys are watching, I'm glad you guys are tuned in today. And you know what? It doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are. Just glad that you're tuned in. You're hearing, hopefully, from the Lord today, speaking through this message and through the scriptures that we're going to cover. Today's lesson is called Stay Prepared and Ready. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew 25, 1 through 13. If you guys want to go ahead and turn there, we'll get to there uh, in a few minutes here. Let me start with a question that comes from our study. It says, when have you tried and failed to hide a bad decision? Now, I know, I know. I'm the only one that has ever made a bad decision and tried to hide it. I know you holy people out there have never done that, but I have. So in doing so, was it something you tried to cheat on a test Maybe you wrote the answers of the test inside your mask that you've been wearing the last two years or on your hand and then you wiped it on your forehead and it didn't work anyways, right? Maybe you've stole something or lied or um, maybe you've snuck out of the house when you weren't supposed to. Again, I know, none of you guys have ever done that, just me. So anyways, that one line takeaway from our study today, if you're going to sum it up all in one line, here it is. Grow in Christ as you wait for his return. That's what we're supposed to do. We are to grow in Christ as we wait upon his return. So growing in Christ's likeness is accomplished. How do we do that? As we act intentionally to pursue Christ as, a, as God works in our lives. So we have to intentionally make it a part of our lifestyle to become more like Christ in, as God works through and in us, right? Jesus could come back at any time. We've been talking about this for like four weeks, y'all. I hope you're getting that. I hope that nail has been hammered in there, right? Jesus could come back at any time, and we don't know when that is. As we wait for his return, we must be uh, devoted um, to continue pursuing him and growing in Christ's likeness, becoming more like him. You see, this happens when we, when we study scripture, when we pray, when we worship. Uh, it happens when we serve others or uh, when we're gathering with our church family. All, and and, and y'all, these are all essential things to be preparing for his return. A quote from our study today says, As we grow in our walk with Christ, it should lead us to grow in our anticipation of his return. Now, in our study... Uh, there's a video that is uh, uh, referenced there by Francis Chan called Anxious for Christ's Return. I want to highly encourage you guys to watch that video. Very good video, very short, like a minute or two. Worth it. Check it out. Now, let's keep going here. It says, we are to live our lives so that when Christ returns, we will be unashamed before him. We see that in 1 John 2, 28. So let me read that to you. So now, little children, remain in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before his coming, right? That's 1 John 2, 28. Let's jump to Matthew 25. Uh, we're talking about Jesus and how he's using this parable uh, to show us how to be prepared today. Jesus had been talking with his disciples who had questioned him about the end times and uh, him coming back, right? And he told them about two events, one that was going to happen soon and another at a time unknown even to him. Now, first, he predicted the destruction of the Jerusalem temple by the Romans, which that occurred in uh, AD 70, right? A second one, he continued teaching them important lessons on uh, about his second coming and how to be ready. Uh, and we're going to dig into that in Matthew 25, verses 1 through 5, if you guys would read with me. Verse 1, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lambs and went out to meet the groom. Verse 2, five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lambs, they didn't take oil with them. But the wise ones took oil in their flask with their lamps. And verse 5 says, when the groom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Now, the background of this parable concerns the Jewish wedding customs of the first century. So before a couple could get married, they went through a period of betrothal similar to engagement, right? And the couple were fully committed to one another. When it was time for the wedding, the groom would go to the bride's home and he'd bring her back to his home for seven day feast. Can you imagine? The groom didn't go alone to pick her up and bring her back though. He was accompanied by a wedding party that escorted the couple. 
And see, in Jesus' parable, uh, the wedding party included the ten virgins, meaning young women who were old enough to be married themselves. Now, here, the word virgin is not used to highlight their abstinence from intimate relationships, but to point to their relationship with the bride. See, these were the bridesmaids, and it was a great honor to be part of the wedding party. Now, one of the bridesmaids' responsibilities was to light the path for the processional, right? The twist in Jesus' story comes um, with the groom being delayed. Now, while they waited, the bridesmaids became tired and fell asleep. So, when they were awakened by shouts and announcing of the groom's arrival, it became clear that the bridesmaids that hadn't been prepared. So, Jesus divided the bridesmaids in to two groups. Now, one of those groups were the foolish bridesmaids. Uh, and these young women wanted to be involved in the wedding party, but they didn't take it as seriously as they should, and they weren't prepared. Now, this type of behavior was a dishonor toward the bride and the groom. Now, the wise virgins not only desired to take part, but they were diligently preparing. Because they loved the bride, they made sure to do their part in honoring the couple. The wise virgins show a, what a life of faith should look like. The foolish virgins were uh, careless, even selfish in their relationship, but the wise virgins thought first of the bride and the groom. And see, people who have true faith in Christ show honor to Jesus through the way they live and just being faithful in preparation. See, Jesus told this parable in regard to his second coming. The foolish virgins represent those who might profess a belief in Jesus, but they haven't prepared for his return. You see, it may seem like Jesus is delayed, and we might be tempted to fall asleep, if you guys are tracking with me there. However, it, if we want to honor God with our lives and experience the blessings associated with following Jesus, we must make sure to be prepared. Now, we read that all are invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. We read that in Revelation 19, verse 9. But only those who accept the invitation, meaning through living by faith and trusting Christ as their Savior, Rescuer and King, those are the ones, right? Uh, those will be able to attend, right? So, guys, here's a couple questions to help us dig deeper in our study. Question number one, uh, how are we sometimes tempted to fall asleep, as the study or the verses show here, as we wait for Jesus' return? Now, the second question in our study, how would you describe a person who's prepared for Christ's return? What do they look like, right? Uh, how do they live their lives? And what are some things we could do to better be prepared? Now, let's keep reading Matthew 25 in verse 6. In the middle of the night, there was a shout. Here's the groom. Come out and meet him. Verse 7. Then all the virgins got up and trimmed their lamps. Verse 8 says, The foolish ones said to the wise ones, Give us some of your oil because uh, our, our lamps are running out. And in verse 9 it says, The wise ones answered, No, there won't be enough for us and for you. Go instead to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. So, in the middle of the night, most people are fast asleep, right? And some people just don't sleep at night. Insomnia, hello, right? You're just up in the middle of the night and you wake up and you're staring at the ceiling like, God, please help me fall asleep and... Nope, still awake, <laughs> right? Uh, since the bridegroom came at such a late, unexpected hour, it helps us to understand that Jesus' return will be at a time that is completely unexpected. All ten bridesmaids were called out to meet the groom, and this uh, is when it became unmistakably clear to the foolish virgins that they weren't prepared. Now, trimming the lamps involved cutting off the charred ends of the rags, uh, and then more oil needed to be added. And this was necessary about every 15 minutes, right? So the story is uh, tragic because as soon as they heard the shout, the foolish virgins knew they had no extra oil and it was too late. Now, this predicament could have been avoided, but they simply hadn't taken the necessary steps to prepare. 
So no specific reason was given for their negligence except that they were foolish. There's a sense of panic in that foolishness uh, of the bridesmaids begging with the wise virgins, right? Give us some of the oil because our lamps are going out, right? They tried to light the rags, but the, without the oil, the foolish virgins' dry cloths would just merely smolder as they uh, were lit. But the wise virgins didn't have oil to spare, so they brought only what they needed, right? Look, being prepared to meet Jesus when he returns is an individual matter. I hope you guys heard that and you understand that. It doesn't matter how faithful grandma is or mom or dad. This is an individual relationship with Christ. See, we must be prepared and we can't share our preparedness with others. Parents do their best to prepare their kids for adulthood. Uh, teachers work on ensuring students have the education they need to find success after school, right? But the truth is that neither parents or teachers, or anyone else for that matter, can do their uh, children or students' lives. You can't live that for other people. You can't do that, right? Each of us is responsible for ourselves, and no one can make choices for another. Look, in the same way, we cannot depend on other people to make us right with God. We can learn from our church leaders and be encouraged by friends and family, but we must make our own decisions. And one day, y'all, each one of us must answer for the choices that we've made. We can encourage others to be prepared, but we can't do the saving. We must point others to Jesus, the only Savior, right? Each person must prepare himself or herself for the coming kingdom. And the time is now, y'all. Look, people prepare for lots of things. Final exams, sports, music, college, career. Uh, but watch this. Many ignore the importance of spiritual preparation. Lack of spiritual preparation has eternal consequences, y'all. And when Jesus returns, whether or not we have oil in our lamps will determine our place, or not, in God's kingdom. Let's just be prepared. How about that? Here's a couple questions to help us dig deeper. Question number three, what keeps some people from being prepared for Christ's return? Question number four says, what do these verses teach us about the need for individual readiness? And question number five, who has helped you the most in being prepared for eternity? Let's keep reading in Matthew 25, verses 10 through 13. Verse 10 reads, When they had gone to buy some, the groom arrived, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Verse 11, Later the rest of the virgins also came and said, Master, Master, open up for us. Listen to this in verse 12. He replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. And then verse 13, therefore, be alert because you don't know either the day or the hour. Y'all listen, this parable has an abrupt and tragic ending. When the foolish bridesmaids left to go buy more oil, the groom arrived and he had no intention of delaying his own wedding and making accommodations for those that were unprepared. Look, the processional moved forward, and the groom and the rest of the wedding party went into the wedding banquet and shut the door. A precaution to keep out the first century wedding crashers, in a sense. <laughs> when the foolish bridesmaids returned, the processional was over, right? And they found themselves locked out. See, when the virgins learned of the groom's arrival, they realized they'd made a big mistake. They went to get oil, but it was too late. As they begged for entrance, the foolish virgins uh, called out, Master, Master, open up for us. And they were saying, we'll honor you now, right? We'll do what's right now. We'll, uh, we are friends of the family, and you know us. Let us in, right? However, though they had been given the honor of being invited into the wedding, they hadn't shown the same honor uh, to the bride and groom. So today people sometimes do this uh, same thing, using words that point to a relationship with God, but their lives don't support this. It doesn't match up to this profession. They will be shut out of God's kingdom. Jesus said clearly, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. 
but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. We see that in Matthew 7, verse 21. In response to their begging, the groom replied, Truly I tell you this right here. Listen to me. When Jesus used this phrase, it meant that what followed was not up for negotiation. And what was not non-negotiable was the reality of the groom's relationship with these five foolish virgins. And we read here, I don't know you, (laughs) right? Once Jesus returns, there will be no last minute second chances to make things right with God, y'all. Being allowed into God's eternal kingdom is ultimately about a relationship with God. Look, we were created to know God and to honor Him in all the ways that we live. And though sin has separated us from God, through Jesus' sacrifice, we are reconciled to Him. We are made right with God. All are invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb, Revelation 19, 7 through 9. Please go there and read it. But we are allowed entry only through genuine saving faith in Jesus. You see, the Christian life is characterized by our living by faith every day. Not every once in a while, not every Sunday for an hour, every day. And in ways that we honor God and by growing, continuing closer in a relationship with Him. Now, Jesus summed up this parable with the same challenge He'd shared earlier. It says, therefore, be alert because you don't know either the day or the hour. You see, we are to stay continually awake, constantly keeping watch. Let's walk with Him fully prepared for Jesus' return. Question number six in our study today, why do we tend to act like we have all the time in the world to get ready for Christ's return? What's wrong with doing that? What's wrong with that approach? And question number seven, when have you seen an example of someone claiming to know Jesus but failing to live like it? And there's a way to approach that, but you have to do it in a loving manner, y'all. Question number eight in our study. What spiritual preparation do we need, do you need to make today in order to be ready for Christ's return? Guys, growing in Christ's likeness is accomplished as we act intentionally. Uh, And we do that to pursue Christ and as God works in our lives. See, Jesus could come back at any time. And as we wait for his return, we must devote ourselves continually pursuing him and growing in Christ's likeness. Now, look, these things happen as we study scripture, as we pray, in worship, as we serve others, as we gather together as a church family. And guys, these things are essential for being prepared for his return. Now, look, I just, uh, a relationship with Christ starts like this. Let me read this. Agreeing with God that you've sinned against him. Agreeing with God about how God feels with sin, about sin. And then you, you can believe that Jesus is the Savior who died on the cross for those sins of the world, meaning your sins and my sins and anyone else's. And then the other part of that, y'all, is committing to turn away from your selfish living, from my selfish living. I, we turn from that, and instead, we live in the ways that honor God. That's where that relationship starts. If you haven't done that, go back, admit, believe, confess. Very simple. Get with a, uh, a mature believer and ask these questions. Am I really know what I'm doing here? Guys, like many people believe we get to heaven by living a good life. That is so far from the truth of Scripture. But according to God's standards, only Jesus has lived the righteous life, y'all, and uh, filled what God required, right? Uh, We could never live a good enough life. Whether or not we're allowed into Jesus' wedding feast depends on whether or not we trust in Him for salvation. Look, half of the bridesmaids who were likely friends of the family were locked out of the wedding feast because they weren't prepared. There are many people in church today who are confident they'll be in heaven, but who haven't truly taken the steps necessary to be prepared. Look, y'all, I hope the Lord has been speaking through this spring Bible Studies for Life series. This is the last one for spring. We're getting ready to start summer next week. Uh, If you guys will join us next week, we're starting with the series, and its first lesson is called Convicted by the Spirit. 
Guys, this is an online resource. You can get hard copies of this from lifeway.com. I have an ebook on my iPad that I can go through and color or highlight and uh, take notes on. Those are like four bucks. Hard copies are like eight bucks. Guys, there's so many ways to get plugged into this. I'm just glad you're here. I hope the Lord's been speaking to you guys. Can't wait to start the summer series with you guys. We will see you next week.